Candidate filing has begun for 2018, and we've got some new information on candidate tax returns. We'll talk about it next on Capital View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, sometimes federal issues, and how they just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. Uh, the 2018 election season is clearly underway. I saw a big line this week at the State Board of Elections here to discuss these and other matters. Charlie Wheeler is back. He is director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield, longtime Chicago Sun Times reporter at the State House. Before that, welcome back, Charlie. Thank you, Bernie. And Andy Maloney is here. He is the State House Bureau Chief for the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. Good to be back. Welcome back, indeed. So we have. The every two-year tradition, Charlie, I, I didn't see you out there Monday morning, but uh, <laughs> I've been at way too many of these. At least the weather was nice at the new location in the last couple of years for the State Board of Elections at a strip mall at, along MacArthur Avenue in Springfield. Long line, hundreds of people were there to file their petitions, all because if you are there by 8 a.m. the first day of filing, and it's a week-long period that ends Monday, uh, you have a chance to be first on the ballot. Everybody in line at 8 uh, you don't have to be at the front of the line, but you're in a lottery for first on the ballot that, that takes place later. So we saw the governor was there, Bruce Rauner. Uh, Daniel Biss was there, one of the Democratic candidates. Uh, Chris Kennedy was not a Democratic candidate, but his uh, uh, running mate, Rod Joy, was. Um, and uh, uh, J.B. Pritzker was there with his running mate as well. Uh, running mates of uh, Biss and uh, Pritzker were both there. So we're off and running. What does it mean? It means we can look forward to uh, almost a year worth of horrible TV commercials with each side trying to outdo the other in terms of exaggerations, hyperbole, distortions, um, fudging the truth, sometimes flat out lying. In other words, a typical campaign season anymore these days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, Andy, I know I should mention, as long as you're the guy that writes about the law a lot, uh, there were several candidates for uh, attorney general, and especially in the wake of Lisa Madigan, mm -hmm. uh, who's been attorney general, is it, is it 16 years or al almost 20, mm -hmm. um, uh, saying she won't run again. She's a Democrat, so State Senator Kwame Raoul uh, has filed. So did Renato Mariotti. He's on MSNBC a lot. He's a lawyer and former prosecutor from Chicago. Nancy Rotering, a Democrat from uh, Mayor of Highland Park. Scott Drury, a state representative who thought of running for governor, but he's a former federal prosecutor, as he mentions from time to time. Pat Quinn, I didn't see him, but his petitions were filed. You don't have to be there in person. A big name, now running for attorney general. And then on the Republican side, Erica Harold was there. She's an attorney in Urbana. She was Miss America in 2013. She's also a graduate of Harvard Law. That's going to be a knockdown drag out and keep you busy. That's just going to be a fascinating race. You've got uh, not only uh, candidates with some na name recognition, including Pat Quinn, um, also uh, uh, I guess you could say Kwame Raoul too. He's been around the legislature. He's done quite a number of things uh, in the state senate after replacing uh, Barack Obama in that seat. But right. um, not yeah, exactly a statewide name right, yet, but, but he's working on it. But he's working on, I think, got the uh, got Cook, some Cook County Cook Democrats, County Democrats endorsed, endorsed him. And he mentioned that a Southern Illinois County in the Metro East uh, also endorsed him even earlier because right. I mentioned, is Cook County your thing? And obviously you don't want to be painted with that right. if you're running statewide. And he's, he mentioned he's been in the Senate 13 years and he's traveled all over the state, et cetera. Right, right exactly. So it, it could be interesting to see if, for instance, uh, Pat Quinn can get some momentum. I think voters still... That, that name should at least ring a bell. It might not be uh, <laughs> super popular for a lot uh, of folks, but I think he, he believes or is trying to make the case that um, you know, he's got that, that sort of built-in advantage. Who's, who's been outspoken. Uh, yeah. he's, a, he's an outsider. Uh, even though he's been in the legislature, he, he is- He's the only Democrat in the legislature who proudly says, I didn't vote for Speaker Madigan for Speaker. Famously uh, uh, didn't vote for the Speaker. So uh, yeah, knock down, drag out is certainly, I think, the right description. We'll see where it goes. Um, one of the people who was not there the first day, of course, Governor Rauner's petitions were filed the first day. Uh, he was not there in person. So, uh, you know, staff or party people or somebody did it for him, campaign people. Uh, and Jean Ives, who is a state representative running for the Republican primary because she thinks Rauner has turned south on some of his promises to conservatives, uh, put out a statement that day just to let 
people know she will be filing by the end of the filing period, which is, again, Monday. Uh, Charlie, it's going to be a, a really interesting race. I don't know if we can handicap it yet. You just did a, a, a big article for Illinois Issues uh, in depth, and the subtitle uh, is... Uh, governor Bruce Rauner's Madigan fixation may reflect how little the governor has to show for his first three years in office. Um, you're, is this taking? A, is this analyzing? Tell, tell us a little bit about what you're talking about. Well, what I what I did, I tried to look back and compare what kind of track records previous governors had when they ran again, and Governor Rauner during his campaign and in his inaugural address laid out an ambitious plan of all the stuff he wanted to do. Virtually none of it got accomplished. The one thing that I give him credit for is changes in the criminal justice system. But that was something that was accomplished in a bipartisan fashion. And we mentioned Kwame Raoul. Kwame Raoul was one of the Democrats who helped negotiate those changes. And I guess, I guess my point was that the governor came in and he had an opportunity to work with the majority party he knew that the majority party was, was a force he had to reckon with and that they weren't going to just say, oh, yeah, you're the governor, whatever you want, here, we'll give it to you. And he didn't adjust accordingly. There's, there's an old saying, a cliche that I'm sure everyone has heard of, the best is the enemy of the good. So the governor had in his mind the best, all this pro-business, anti-union stuff. This is what's best for Illinois. And along the way, he, he lost the opportunity to do the good. He could have gotten changes, for example, I believe, in workers' compensation or in the, the personal injury lawsuit area. But because he was so focused on this broad anti-union agenda pro-business, he was not able to build the coalitions that he needed. And as a matter of fact, um, I said that, or I pointed out that he's the only governor we've had in darn near 200 years of statehood that couldn't get a budget passed. Yes. On the other hand, it, it did seem like, I mean, he had talked about, you know, leverage in the past that, uh, and I know one of his opponents, J.B. Pritzker, keeps quoting what uh, Rauner said to the editorial board of the Chicago Tribune early in his tenure, crisis creates opportunity. We, we need this time to make pro-business changes in Illinois and we can basically use the lack of, of a budget or whatever to get Democrats to come along to my side. And he has always said, Democrats are really with me. Mike Madigan is the problem. That's baloney. I mean, that's what he said. And, and, oh, he I know. Had, and, and as, your, as your article pointed out, <laughs> he spent tens of millions of dollars saying Mike Madigan is a bad guy. The Republican Party that he largely funds says the same thing. Will that work this time around? He ran against Pat Quinn the first time, can he run against Mike Madigan and win in a year when it will be midterm for President Trump and it might be an ener energized Democratic voter base? When I go in the voting booth and I look up and down the list of candidates, I'll see Bruce Rauner's name. I won't see Mike Madigan. I won't even see his daughter because Lisa's not running <laughs> again. Uh, only in one legislative district out of 118 is Mike Madigan's name going to be on the ballot. So what am I going to do? Am I going to say, oh, well, here's, here's uh, candidate, Democratic candidate Andy Maloney. He's a Democrat. He's got to be a puppet of Mike Madigan. Well, the governor says this, and that the governor, Andy, as you know, has been going around uh, in appearances where he does politics and says, ask the Democrats running, will you vote for Mike Madigan for speaker? And if they say yes, you should be for the other person so we can get a majority. I know he and the Republican Party are still thinking in this, again, year midterm Donald Trump first year that they can gain more seats in the legislature. Uh, your, any thoughts on the strategy? It's, and I've said it before, I think, on this program, too. It's sort of like he has a, that song stuck in his head. You know, it's, it's a refrain that gets repeated um, almost at every chance that he gets. Uh, and I think he looks back on 2014 and how he came in and, you know, obviously spent a lot of his money to get elected. Um, but sort of played that card, right? Term limits, thinly veiled, uh, kind of anti-Madigan reform that polls very popularly. And, um, you know, I, I don't think there was any question that, that that was aimed at people like the speaker. Um, and and it, I think it also gets back to what you said, Charlie, about this is sort of the, the tone of the campaign season, right? We, we haven't really uh, gotten out of that tone, I think, in the last mm. four years. It's it's We haven't tamped down on the rhetoric, and that was um, part and parcel to, to why we didn't didn't get a budget. But 
Um, I tend to think that the, the person at the top, the executive, uh, sort of wears the jacket whenever there's a big problem in the state or there's, there's something that uh, enormous going on, like a budget impasse. Um, but he, I think he is convinced that, the, that if he keeps putting the speaker out there, uh, people are going to at least not uh, vote for Democrats or maybe even vote for him. Well, interestingly, uh, the race is getting some national attention. The National Review, which is a conservative publication, uh, just came out with a cover story. Just read a small uh, snippet that was uh, in the Capital Facts blog, but it, it's got a picture of Rahner and a kind of a turned over broken down motorcycle next to him and it calls him the worst Republican governor in America uh, on Bruce Rauner's Illinois breakdown. John Miller is the writer. Uh, the, the, it, it seemed to show that he has not been true to conservative principles. This is one other thing that Gene Ives, the state representative from Wheaton, is running against him on, that he signed a bill to uh, House Bill 40 to uh, expand abortion rights to those on Medicaid, so it's, it would be taxpayer-funded abortion, that he signed a bill to make it harder to, for local law enforcement to work with feds. They're not supposed to work with feds to turn over people who are illegal just based on their uh, and immigration unless there's, status. Unless there's a, a judge has said so. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah unless there's... Which is a big distinction, a, a, I think. A more serious thing. So uh, he is getting some heat nationally. What does that do? Does this give Gina Ives an in? Uh, she's also got some pretty strong thoughts herself on, on various issues. I would think, looking at the entire picture, that it could actually work to Governor Rauner's benefit. Because the very things that the National Review is hammering him on are things that to the moderate Illinois voter probably aren't all that bad. And you have Jeannie Ives is very conservative, far to the right of Governor Rauner, and she will make him appear more moderate so that in the general election he may have a better shot with people who are not fierce partisans one way or the other and are getting turned off by the fringe elements in each party having the loudest voices. They might say, well, here's, here's a guy, he's a businessman, he was successful, and he's not hard right uh, because the, the right wing has been attacking him. So maybe I can go along with him. Yeah, well, we'll see where that goes. We, um, there was a lawsuit filed this week, uh, one of, I think it's by various state representatives and the Thomas More Society, which promotes religious freedom. They were involved in like the uh, 10 year anniversary of the nativity scene being in our Capitol Rotunda, which is part of freedom of speech. There was a ceremony there, a nice memory of Dan Zanoza by his wife, Julie, people from Lincoln who got that all started 10 years ago. But this lawsuit is uh, saying the state should not be able to spend taxpayer money on abortion. Do uh, long shot? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think at this point, anything you uh, uh, sort of, you know, one of the people who drafted this was Representative Peter Breen, who is an attorney with the Thomas More Society and also kind of one of the floor leaders uh, right. for the House Republicans. Um, it seemed uh, that the two claims were, like you said, you know, we don't have taxpayer money to pay for these abortions and we have this balanced budget uh, uh, requirement in our Constitution, although that gets, as Charlie uh, often points out, <laughs> conflated in certain ways. And um, the other claim, I, I think, was that um, the, the bill itself, uh, there's a deadline on, on approving bills with a regular majority in the legislature, and I think their argument is that, well, this one was held up for so so long and it didn't get a super majority that it needed. I so think a, technical, a, a technical Yeah, and, and I would say specifically on that too, the, the courts tend to leave the legislative process alone a lot of times. It doesn't happen every time, but they like um, you know, they're always conscious of separation of powers. And the legislative process, anytime you're hinging something on, well, the General Assembly didn't uh, uh, abide by the reading requirements, I think judges tend to leave that alone. Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, on every bill that ultimately leaves the legislature's hands and goes to the governor, the Senate president and the House speaker sign the bill saying, we attest that all the procedural requirements in the Constitution have been met by this piece of legislation. The enrolled bill doctrine, I think is what it's called. Yeah, yeah. it basically gives them deference. Uh, if they say that their rules were followed, their rules were followed. So um, he, he makes some claims in the lawsuit and um, it just has to take we'll months where, and months to percolate. We'll see where it goes system. from here, that's right. Um, uh, elsewhere on the political scene, um, as he was filing, 
uh, his petitions and talking to reporters outside the State Board of Elections, Daniel Biss, the state senator from Evanston, who released five years of his own personal tax return some months ago and has been calling on the other candidates who have a lot more money to do so, uh, said the same thing in the morning. By later in the day, at least uh, very basic cover sheets of, of tax returns for one year. J.B. Pritzker released cover sheets of tax returns for, I think, three. Uh, I think you have some of the details. Yeah, uh, Pritzker uh, 15, reported 15 million in taxable 15, income, uh -huh. uh, and uh, Chris Kennedy 1.2 million taxable right. income. Um, I, I can't remember what the, the totals had been leading up to uh, this previous year for Pritzker, um, but um, you know, obviously a lot of his money comes from in investments and, right. and, well, and he, that you type know, of thing. Right, well, he, trusts. And trusts. trusts, and we don't know, yeah, the full picture, and clearly Daniel Biss was um, outraged that they didn't release their full tax returns like he thinks the president should have done. It, uh, in fairness, it, it should also be said Governor Rauner, who has released tax returns regularly, um, only releases like the first two pages of his state and the first two pages of his uh, federal tax return each year. Um, and so that puts Prisker and Kennedy similar to what Rauner has done, but if they were critical of Rauner, then should they have done more, or would Rauner just use that? I don't know. Charlie, do you have any thoughts? On, it's not a legal requirement for candidates not for or anything else to release their tax returns, so you open yourself to it, but you also show you're transparent, but then in the case of Pritzker and Kennedy, you show you're transparent only to the same point the governor's been transparent, who's the Republican, who is worth somewhere between 500 a million and a billion, whereas Pritzker is on the Forbes list and is worth like three, like billion, three and a half, billion, and a half yeah. billion. Does yeah, it we're, matter? We're do you, th do you think money. it matters yeah. much to the people out I'm there? Not sure, I'm not sure that the average citizen really cares that much, but on the other hand, the value in it is not just the cover sheet. Um, I'm sure viewers will remember back in math classes in grade school where they were told, show your work. It's not enough just to put down the answer. How did you get here? Well, this is what we're getting on these tax returns. We get the first couple pages. It says, here's my taxable income. Here's what my deductions were, but we don't know what they were. And the value in it is for an interested citizen to know whether some of the activities from which I'm deriving an economic benefit might be in conflict with my responsibilities as an elected official. That's, it's not just nosiness, you know, or curiosity. It's, is there a potential for a conflict because of the sources of income that this individual has who's asking to be one of our leaders? Right. Understood. Uh, now, the other thing, in addition to tax returns, everybody has to file um, a financial disclosure form. There have been complaints over the years that the candidate forms don't ask enough, but if you make, like, whatever it is, if you, I think, own a certain small percentage of a company or if you make uh, several thousand dollars in a year, maybe it's 5,000, you have to put down uh, any, any entity that you, any stock that you own if you're a, or company that you're a part of that's bigger. And so a long list came out for Pritzker and I think for Kennedy, I know the Sun-Times did a story on some of the big companies, oil co companies and uh, things like that that might not necessarily go along with philosophy of wind energy or something. <laughs> but, you know, the people uh, have lots of holdings, so we will get a look at this. And, I, and R Governor Rauner, by the way, also has two or three pages of funds or companies that he has some kind of either ownership in or income piece from. Of, yeah. So you get a little bit of that over time. And we'll see where it goes because uh, ultimately, Charlie, like you said, we'll see lots of ads on TV and it depends to a lot of people on the street. It will depend who spends the most money telling you a specific thing about that other person's record, be it quite true or not. <laughs> but, but we'll see where it goes. Um, another, uh, let's talk about marijuana. <laughs> uh, there is a travel writer, I know he's in the Tribune, uh, named Rick Steves. Mm -hmm had a press conference in Chicago along with some legislators, uh, Senator Heather Staines from Chicago and Kelly Cassidy, both Democrats, basically saying we should legalize marijuana. They got a, a bigger name, Rick Steves. I don't think he's viewed as a political person, but I know he said, you know, people are using it anyway. Other states haven't seen some of the horror stories you might expect, you know, when people warn of legalization. Why don't we make the product better and tax it? And I know Pritzker is for this, and I think uh, some of the other, uh, I think this is, and Kennedy with reservation to a certain extent, de decriminalization but not legalization. Um, Pritzker said uh, at a group he spoke at in Springfield this week, a labor group, um, 
that he thought it could raise 300 to 700 million dollars a year. Any uh, chance Illinois will go for this in an election year and, and as other states are leading the way? If you're handicapping it, I, I would say this year, no. Um, but you look back in the previous years and we've done medicinal marijuana, we've done a certain level of decriminalization of marijuana. And it's, uh, if you looked at the public approval of, uh, of, of marijuana, I, I would think that it's, it's going up. It's becoming more acceptable. Um, and that's uh, not just in Illinois, but across the country. And so that was part of uh, Rick Steves' point is we've done this in, in Washington. He says, and he made sure to say this several times, he says, I'm not pro pot. I am uh, anti sort of prohibition. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was sort of the well, comparison. It's interesting. That you know, even in Springfield, if you go down certain streets, that because we have medical marijuana dispensaries in and around Springfield, I think there's at least two um, in or, or near the, and near the city, there's billboards all over the place. You know, marijuana changed my life, and and you know, come get it. It's okay. And of course, you have to go through a very strenuous process. There's only certain diseases on the list that can be treated with that. If it's just the medical system that we have in the trial period, and you have to get a doctor to you know prescribe it. Uh, but you're right. It it makes it it's become more normalized over time. Well, and there's and there's a couple practical reasons. Uh, I, I agree. I don't think it's going to happen in an election yeah. year because it's, it's too tempting to do these, these reefer madness type attack ads <laughs> against anybody who votes for it. But in the long run, you figure that the money that is spent on prosecuting marijuana offenses, we don't lock up as many people as we used to, that could probably be better spent on real criminal activity plus the money in the back in the black market. The fact that marijuana isn't legal doesn't mean that people don't use it, you can't get it, you can't buy it. I'm sure if any of us wanted to, we could within an hour we could buy marijuana. I have no idea. Yeah. Well <laughs> <laughs> You're I, making an educated I'm, guess. I'm I like think. Bill Clinton. I tried it once but I didn't inhale. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was darn near fifty years ago. <laughs> but there's the state needs dollars too, and this is a in a sense, it's a painless sort of tax because nobody has to smoke pot. And if they do, you pay a tax on it, sort of like gambling, sort of like alcohol. And if you regulate it like alcohol, there's, I don't think there's really that big a, of a health problem. Plus, tying into another major issue, there are people who say that medical marijuana has helped wean me off the opiates that I was that using I for pain reduction. And so that's something that you have to look at, too, with this whole opioid crisis that's going yeah, well on. Well, it is, it is an interesting move. I mean, we don't know where Governor Rauner is on this. He's been slow in his administration to approve new classes of illness to use medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, he's clearly, as you said earlier, Charlie, uh, worked with Democrats to try to reduce prison population. And certainly as you decriminalize or take away criminal penalties for some of the drug stuff that has uh, really helped the prison population grow in recent decades, you know, kind of moving in the other direction. Now, maybe maybe it would be time to go for that, but again, again, it, it might depend on waiting out the election to yeah. see if, if it's too controversial. We'll, we'll see who, who goes there. Um, there was a hearing, uh, as we take the show today, in Chicago, and there's, I guess, a series of a few hearings about the new uh, Medicaid uh, Rauner administration uh, got done. So Democrats complained that it didn't get done uh, with enough light or scrutiny uh, and not under all the normal procurement plans. Rauner people say it's fine. It, they s and what it is is uh, a single, I guess companies will get paid a price for each Medicaid recipient. They want to move more people on Medicaid and there's like three million people in the state into these uh, managed care systems. There are 12 companies now, but it, it, under the new contract, I guess it takes effect January 1st, there'll be seven. Um, Governor Rauner is going around saying it will save two to three hundred million dollars a year. Um, but the full cost over four years uh, has gone up to like sixty three million billion dollars. So it's like the largest contract letting in state history. Uh, and, and any I thoughts that, on that where was, this goes? That, that was one of the things that really caught a lot of lawmakers off guard because early on the administration was estimating this will be probably ten billion dollars a year and we'll do it for four years and then suddenly the contract comes out and it's like sixty billion over and four years over so it's four years so it's like a, a, a twenty billion dollar increase and they're saying wait wait a second how did this happen and it was not done in the full light of day 
in the eyes of the lawmakers. And in fact, there was legislation introduced, passed, and vetoed by the governor that would have required the process to be redone with more public scrutiny, more hearings, more testimony, and so on. Well, we'll see where it goes. The, obviously, the Democrats, the, I remember a press conference, particularly some legislators from around Chicago were worried that one of the managed care facilities up there, one of the 12, wouldn't be included. I think it wasn't, but, you know, it's a new day, and we'll see if in his, you know, last year of his first term, if Governor Honor can show the savings that we've got. I will mention, uh, I almost have to apologize to Congressman Mike Bost, who used to be in the legislature, he was in line at the State Board of Elections. He said hello to me. I asked him if he's decided what he's doing in the race for governor, and he said uh, he hasn't decided because he knows Jeannie Ives, and he agrees with Governor, works well with Governor Rauner, but disagrees with him on some things. He became the fourth of the seven Republican U.S. House members from Illinois, also John Shimkus, Darren LaHood, and Peter Roskam, who have not said who they're for for governor, uh, even though we have a Republican incumbent. How odd is that? Uh, pretty odd, I think. Uh, I, I think it's it, it stems back to the House Bill 40 and the immigration bill that we talked about sooner that uh, have caused a rift in, in Republican circles. All right. Well, we'll have to see where it goes. And sorry, Representative Boss, but it was nice to talk to you. I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, thank you to Charlie Wheeler and Andy Maloney. I'm Bernie Schoenberg. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Capitol View.